on YouTube. Let's just keep that in mind. And I'm gonna open up the doors to share the screen. Thank you. You guys did a test on screen sharing for Tim? Just keep that in mind. And I'm gonna open up the doors. We did not. That. Okay. Tim, why don't you do a quick screen share test? Uh, it's disabled participant screen sharing. So I guess you got to upgrade. Uh, you should be a co host. So let's promote you. You should be able to now. Yep. Yep. Next time, Hillary, please promote your co host to co host so they can do their screen share test. There you go. Great. Looks good. All right, I'm going to take it back over for a second. Mm -hmm. Just put the generic slide up. Perfect. All right, we're going to open the doors. Good deal. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll be starting in just a couple moments. Let's let everybody have a chance to come in and get settled. Glad you guys could make it today. Thanks for spending a Sunday afternoon or early evening with us, depending upon where you're located. We'll be starting in just a moment. We're glad to be bringing our Lightroom Hangouts back for monthly opportunities to jump in and learn more about Lightroom. So we're glad you guys could be with us here today. We've got an excellent guest. We're gonna be joined by Tim Gray here in just a moment. And uh, Tim's gonna be able to share a lot of cool techniques related to landscape photography. And uh, we'll also throw in a couple of bonus tips. I'll show a few things on panoramic. And uh, we'll take a look at a cool product called Aftershoot from one of our partners who's sponsoring this event. So we're glad that you guys could be with us. People are still trickling in and uh, it's still technically uh, about 60 seconds before we're supposed to begin. So we'll just give everybody a chance to get in and get settled before we start. So thank you guys for coming tonight. And uh, thanks for spending your Sunday with us. We'll just give everybody a second to get settled. If you can, please go ahead in the chat area. Let us know that you could hear us or that tell us where you're coming from. I see we got Sweden, which is awesome. And uh, Bothell, Washington. I've been there. Some beautiful shots there. Buffalo, New York, Ontario, Toronto, Tennessee. It's just awesome to me that we can get people from so many different parts of the world together around exactly. one common love, which is photography. So, Tim, you're popular. <laughs> <laughs> got a few friends showing up excellent awesome so uh good well we'll start the program here in one second you guys would notice that there's actually a section called q a so the benefit of the q a section is you can put questions in there that you want to ask of tim or i and other people can actually vote on the questions. so the most popular questions will raise to the top and we'll do our best to tackle those questions today so please feel free if you've got any questions to toss them into the Q&A section. Uh, that's the best way we can handle them. We won't really be able to take live questions with open mics quite yet. So use that Q&A section. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're gonna kick things off with just a quick poll. And this is just so we can know a little bit more about you. So just two simple questions. So for those of you who are here, do us a favor, let us know which version of Lightroom you use the most and what you consider your skill level. So just let us know a little bit about your experience level and which version of Lightroom you like. Uh, this will help. I see overwhelmingly a lot of Lightroom Classic. <laughs> That's what we prepared to show today. But don't worry, if you use Lightroom or Lightroom Mobile, the techniques work there as well. And uh, I'm sure we can switch over and, and do one image over there as well, just to show you that. So that's great that so many of you are voting. We appreciate you guys coming out and letting us know what's on your mind. All right, well, let's kick things off. It looks like a few people are still trickling in, but we'd love to fill every minute with some good content. This is the Photo Focus Lightroom Hangout, and it's brought to you in part from our friends over at Aftershoot. Aftershoot is a super cool product that is an AI, that's as an artificial intelligence culling tool. And culling is the act of finding your sharpest and best photos. So Aftershoot could take a large photo shoot and analyze it and automatically mark the bad photos, the ones that have soft focus, the ones that aren't best composed or have eyes closed for portraits. And it analyzes things with actually more than 13 different image tests and then rates your images so you can find the best photos. 
So I'll give you a demo of that later today on a, a recent photo shoot of some bald eagles, and you'll see how it's able to identify the sharpest pictures and the best composed. So again, you can check out Aftershoot, just head on over to their website. And uh, we've got a discount code over at PhotoFocus as well. You can use the code PhotoFocus or just click the link over at PhotoFocus.com and it will save you 10% uh, on that, taking it down $10 a year. Okay. So uh, Tim's put together a great agenda today, and I just added one item to it, which is a little bit of panoramas, because I love panoramas. But uh, Tim, why don't you walk us through some of the things you're going to cover today and what you're looking forward to, and then I'll tell folks a little bit about you. Sure. And maybe you can also then tell us what happens with Aftershoot if you have all of your photos in perfect focus. Perfect. Uh, I, I think you level up and you go to photography heaven and uh, <laughs> you clearly got a great night's sleep and didn't get up early and don't drink coffee. You're going to be very happy. Yeah, exactly. That would be actually a cool message to get from the software. It's like, everything's great. They're all perfect. Nothing to worry yeah. about here. You can retire. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I put together some tips for optimizing landscape photos. And some of these I'm sure are going to be very familiar. Some hopefully will give you some new ideas. And I think most importantly, I want to sort of focus on giving you some kind of nuance, giving you some of the details behind the thought process that I typically go through in terms of enhancing landscape photos. There's certain things that are sort of common, you know, the, the degree of detail, depth of field, and those sorts of things. Then there's some things that are a little more subjective in terms of what we're going to have in terms of shadow detail versus highlight detail and those sorts of topics. So I'll just go through a variety of, well, I think my favorite adjustments, the, the adjustments I tend to focus on the most when it comes to landscape photos. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. And I'm glad that you're actually taking a look at some of the profiles there for both lens profiles and also uh, some of the specific camera profiles can be pretty exciting because I think a lot of times people fall in love with an image and, and they forget that the camera did some in-camera processing and then they open up the raw file and they're like, wait, this isn't what I saw. Exactly. But it's just a click away, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you know, I hear from a lot of photographers, they get their images into, you know, Lightroom, whatever software they're using to process their raw captures. And you know, to your point, it's like, wait a second, it looked a little better on the camera's LCD screen. And yeah. that's because when on the LCD screen, well, in general, you're not really looking at a raw photo because a raw photo sort of is not really a photo per se. It's a data file that contains the information that was gathered by your camera's image sensor. And so your camera is interpreting that raw capture to show you a preview image on your LCD display. And then of course, software is generating a preview based on that raw capture. And every bit of software is going to use a different algorithm, a different approach to how you're actually processing the appearance of that photo, at least as a baseline. You can always fine tune, as we'll see some examples of here today. Uh, but to your point, um, when we look at Lightroom Classic, for example, we can apply profiles and those give us the ability to mimic the, the look of a particular camera, which for many photographers can be a nice way to get started, at least a more familiar way to get started in terms of yeah. the initial interpretation of the photo. You could always make the image look better, but at least it looks like what you remember from the field. Well, exactly. before we begin, folks, I just want to give you a quick background. My name's Rich Harrington. I'm the publisher of PhotoFocus. So we've been publishing for 24 years about photography now. And uh, every day we put out articles and resources to help people learn more about photography. So you're welcome to check us out at PhotoFocus.com. And when I get the time, I try to put out books and videos to help as well. Occasionally get a chance to speak at conferences and other events. So you're glad you guys can check that out. And... Uh, Let's see here. There we go. And uh, feel free. You know, I, my particular area of love is panoramic photography. So I'll show you a little bit of that related to landscape later today. But uh, if I figured it out, I've put it in a book and uh, you're welcome to connect. Just find me on LinkedIn. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about our guest, uh, we're glad to have Tim. Tim is a well-known and highly respected photo educator. And uh, he has put together, at least according to your bio, 18 books. Is your bio up to date or have you done another one? And didn't I believe that's the latest count. Yeah, I believe All that's right. the latest that's, count. <laughs> that's an impressive number of books. And uh, you also may have seen some of his articles in magazines like Digital Photo Pro and Outdoor Photographer. So Tim's been publishing for many years and definitely knows how to help folks. Uh, he also regularly answers questions through his newsletter and also teaches hands-on workshops. So if you want to learn more about Tim, you can head on over to his website at timgrayphoto.com. So uh, we're going to get things started. Tim, I'm going to let you start to share things. And uh, I'll stop screen sharing here for a second. 
And then in a second, we'll take a few questions from folks and start to add those in. But uh, when you're ready, feel free to go ahead and start screen sharing. All right, I shall share that screen. There we go. So we should all be in great shape. Looking at a photo here from Austria as it turns out. And so I'm gonna start off talking about essentially the detail level. Well, there's several tips I'm gonna give you related to detail level in a photo, but this first tip relates to highlights and shadows and especially focused on landscape photography. Again, it's gonna be the focus here tonight. And I wanna start off, Rich mentioned the profiles. And so I do wanna point out that within the basic section on the right panel here in the develop module in Lightroom Classic, we can choose a particular profile. So you can see here, I just have the default Adobe color profile. There's a pop-up here that'll show me my favorites. We can also click the browser, a little grid of four icons, little four rectangles on the right-hand side. And I can go through and find different profiles. And Richard mentioned the, the concept of the camera matching. And so based on the camera that you're actually using, profiles that are intended essentially to mimic the in-camera processing, included, including for different categories of adjustments. So in your camera, you might have a setting for a portrait or landscape, for example, and you can mimic those. You can see that we've got, you know, the faithful, which is sort of just a baseline adjustment, landscape photos, portrait photos. And again, those are just based on mimicking the processing in your camera so that you're starting off with something that is closer to what you'd see on the back of the LCD display, which for many photographers obviously can be very helpful. But then we start getting into fine tuning. So I love having a good starting point. We want to start with the best image that we possibly can right from the start. But I'm a control freak. I really want to get in there and fine tune the overall appearance of the photo. And sometimes it's it's fairly subtle. There's some things that can be pretty straightforward. So I'm sure many of you are familiar, for example, with the whites and the blacks sliders where we're essentially setting the endpoint for the brightest and the darkest pixels. And so I generally use a clipping preview here. So holding the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh and then adjusting the white point, and we can increase and decrease the value for white. And as we do that, as we increase the value, we start to see where clipping occurs, where I've lost detail in the highlight areas of the photo. And generally, we don't want to sacrifice highlight detail if we can avoid it. Similar concept for the blacks, setting that darkest black point. And as a very general rule, we do want with our landscape photos, the brightest pixel to be right around white and the darkest pixel to be right around black. There's plenty of exceptions to that rule, but it's a pretty good rule of thumb for getting started. So I'll hold the alter option key and adjust that black point again, just about to the point where I've got a little bit of clipping in the very darkest shadows. But to me, that's just a very rudimentary starting point. I might fine tune the exposure. Hopefully it came out of the camera absolutely perfect, but I can fine tune if the exposure seems to be just a little bit off, I can adjust that as needed. But where I really start to feel like I'm getting to exercise control over the image is where we can adjust the highlights and the shadows independent of one another. So I can lighten or darken the highlights. I can lighten or darken the shadows. For the highlights, I've already set, keep in mind, that white point based on the brightest pixels in the image, which means usually I'm not going to further brighten the highlights. It's not that there's no exceptions to that. It's just there's not, in my experience, that many exceptions. So what's more common is that I might reduce the value for highlights. And so if you notice the waterfall here, the bright highlights, we know for a fact that we have detail in the waterfall there because we saw the clipping preview for the whites slider. And so we know that it's not clipped. There's some level of detail there, but from the standpoint of what's visually discernible, it can be very, very helpful to reduce the value for highlights, which will of course darken the bright areas of the photo. But one of the really cool features of that highlight slider is that as we darken the highlights, you might expect things to get a little bit muddy in appearance, but in fact, Lightroom Classic will apply what's essentially a little bit of a clarity enhancement to the image, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's giving us additional contrast. So we're darkening those highlights, but also enhancing contrast a little bit, which can really help to make that detail stand out just a little bit better. And so more often than not, if there's an area, you know, bright clouds or waterfall or what have you, an area that's relatively bright, more often than not, I'm going to darken that down just a little bit to enhance the detail there. That's pretty straightforward. I think reasonably universal. Then we get to the more subjective option and that would be the shadows. And so if we go to the shadows slider, 
And we'll pay attention, for example, this area of the photo in the forest here alongside the waterfall. If I increase the value for shadows, I'm opening up. It's like adding a fill flash effect. If I reduce the value, then I'm darkening up the shadow areas. Now, this, this is where it gets a little subjective. A lot of landscape photographers want to bring out as much detail as possible. And so they're going to have a tendency to brighten up the shadows at least a little bit to taste, of course, to bring out more of the texture and detail in those darker areas. I'm all for that, except for me personally, I do have a tendency to like to darken up those shadows to get a little bit more moody effect, a little bit more contrast, a little more impact in the photo. And so uh, sub subjective, obviously you can kind of put your own spin on that and interpret just a little bit. But the point is having that control. It's a pretty straightforward feature. It's been around for a while. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it, but if you really focus on the nuance there and trying to think not in terms of just lightening and darkening different areas, but to what extent are you revealing additional detail in those areas of a photo? So Tim, one yeah. question I'd like to ask about this picture, because not everybody knows this trick. It looks to me that you used a slightly longer shutter speed so that your water got a little frothy here and milky. Can Correct. you walk people through the basics of the camera settings? Because not everybody's uh, familiar with this style of shooting. I can, absolutely. So in this case, this is it happens to be the Galling waterfall in Austria. and the water's moving pretty fast. And so I didn't need an especially slow shutter speed to get this. And in fact, you can see, it's probably pretty apparent from the photo here, I'm perched with my tripod on this rocky little you know, outcropping and the thundering waterfall is actually making those rocks tremble just a little bit. You could feel the vibration. And so I wanted a slow shutter speed to get that motion blur effect in the water, that silky look in the water but without getting so slow that I risk getting some camera vibration that's gonna make the image soft. And so you can see my camera settings up here at the right, at the top right. So I'm using a 12 millimeter lens. This is on a crop sensor. So that would translate to, well, what's 12 times 1.6 on the fly, something like 18 millimeters, somewhere in there, 17, 18 millimeters uh, equivalent on a full frame. And then stopping down to get a little bit more depth of field because I've got focus in the foreground, obviously I wanted to have a pretty good amount of depth of field to get all the way back to that waterfall and ISO all the way down at 100. In this case, it's a little bit of a part overcast, thin overcast, overcast sky. And so I was able to get a 1 20th of a second. Now with water, it's gonna vary a little bit. In some cases, really fast moving water, you might get, as in this case, you know, a 20th, 30th of a second will give you a good result. For kind of more typical flowing streams and whatnot, somewhere in the quarter of a second range is usually good. And if it's a little bit slower moving water, obviously you might go longer. And of course you can go even longer and get a really kind of ethereal silky sort of effect. It's a matter of preference and taste. For me personally, I usually like to not go so long that I'm getting total silkiness with no texture. I like to have a little bit of a texture within that motion blur effect for flowing water. All right, so we'll dive into some color considerations here. And one of my favorite, and I feel like I say that a lot, one of my favorite adjustments, because I have a lot of favorites in different categories, but when it comes to color, one of my top favorite adjustments is vibrance. Now, of course, for any image that includes color, and in situations such as a sunset where color was part of the reason that you captured the photo in the first place, you're going to want to boost the saturation. But let's just take that saturation up so people can really appreciate the amazing color we had. Then they look at your photo and say, you know, what is this, a cartoon? What are we doing here? The color is just outrageous. And yet with the foreground, you'll notice the wheat here in the foreground, the color looks, you know, kind of golden hour, nice. It doesn't look over-processed, but the sky here above the sun is looking a little bit overcooked. And that's where vibrance comes in. This is where <laughs> vibrance really helps me because I describe vibrance as saturation with built-in self-control. So <laughs> if you have a hard time kind of holding back a little bit when it comes to boosting the colors. Vibrance is very, very helpful. What vibrance essentially does, it has a, an uneven effect on color saturation. Think of it as boosting the saturation for the colors that need it without overdoing the colors that don't really need the help. And so in the context of landscape photography, it means the colors that are a little bit muted are gonna get a big boost. The colors that are already fairly saturated are just gonna get a more subtle boost. Vibrance also, by the way, protects skin tones. So if you're a portrait photographer, all the more reason that you'd wanna use vibrance rather than saturation. And so as I boost the value for vibrance, you'll notice that I'm not getting that sort of artificial color. I'm more sort of evening out the overall saturation within the photo. 
And so I'm able to be more aggressive and to get a more natural look where the colors are balancing each other out. We're sort of bringing the colors that are not very saturated up to the level of those that are saturated in a manner of speaking, obviously, you know, within reason. But you can see I can really push the vibrance pretty far and get a good result. Whereas if I increase the saturation too much, I start to get a, a look that can be a little bit artificial looking. And so very often I'll just ignore saturation, go right to vibrance, and that's all I need. I can oftentimes be a little bit aggressive, put a pretty strong setting on vibrance. But there's another handy trick that I find that I use on a very regular basis when it comes to vibrance, because sometimes I need to really push the colors that need the help a lot in order to get them up closer to the level of the colors that are already saturated. And so with this image, for example, I'll push that vibrance. And by the time I start to feel that the sky and the grasses here are getting up to sort of match each other in some respect, in terms of that overall saturation, then the colors start to look saturated to too much of an extent. So we've evened out the saturation, but now the overall effect is too much. So you might be tempted then to pull back on vibrance. Okay, I went too far, let me back it off a little bit. But then one of the set of colors, one of the ranges of colors. So here, for example, the greens start to take on a little bit in my mind, a, too much of a muted look. While I'm still happy with the sky, I wouldn't mind a little more saturation there, but the, the greens are starting to fall apart a little bit more quickly. And so what I do in that type of scenario is take the vibrance up to where I'm happy with kind of the balance between the different colors in terms of the overall saturation, and then use just a little bit of a negative setting for saturation. So fairly strong positive value for vibrance, and then a little bit of a negative value for saturation. So we're evening out the overall color saturations within the image, and then toning it down so it doesn't look a little bit over processed. All right. And then very nice. Hey, Tim, Thank I'm going to share yeah. an image really quick. While yeah, you absolutely. Your next one. But you That'd should take great. a look at the, the Q&A. There's some good questions in there and uh, queue up a couple of answers. I'll go. I'll do a real quick one here and then I'll pass back sure. to you if that's all right. Absolutely. Perfect. <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to show people uh, a couple of questions were in there about profiles a little bit more. And uh, I'm just going to show you something in play here. So in this case, I've got a stitched panorama. And so I've been doing the panning across and making sure that with each image, there's about a 50% overlap. That's going to really minimize the distortion. But you could see there how I have a, uh, an intruder in my shot, but that's okay. We'll get rid of them. When you select all of those, you can right click and choose photo merge panorama. And this gives you really three choices. Spherical works best if you have a large curvature. So if you're doing a lot of top to bottom, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Cylindrical tends to be more for flat on and perspective if it is if there's an anchor point. So most of the time cylindrical works nice. And then you could either crop to lose the edges or let Lightroom kind of stretch your edges with boundary warp to try to push the distortion out a little bit. Then you just click merge and it will merge those together. Now, here's that resulting DNG file. And this is basically a new raw file. And if we go into the develop module, you can still see information. So I look at my original files. This was shot over on a Nikon. So that means if I want, even though I've made a DNG, we can open up the profiles there and start to browse those. So this gives us the ability to look at specific types and then match them and you see we can go back to the original camera matching the landscape. Now, Tim, I know you brought up the, the histogram there and the use of clipping. We're gonna end up taking that guy out. I get really lazy with my histogram and like to actually just kind of massage it just by pulling on the histogram itself, which kind of really just lets you know exactly the zone you're working. And so there I'm just flattening out my shadows a little bit so that it opens that up and then pull the blacks back down and like you, I like to see that clipping. So I don't mind a little bit of the clipping in the pure. Um, once you start really getting in there though, it becomes pretty simple. Now, some of these are fixed. You'll see that the amount slider doesn't change guys. That's because they're meant to stimulate the camera. The stylistic ones you can adjust. And I'm with you, Tim. I really like that ability. You see here it auto-toned and really brought the highlights down. I'm gonna actually take the exposure down just a little more and lift the shadows. And that works quite nicely to get that in the right ballpark. 
Then as we take a look in our presence category, we could just put a little bit back in, but again, being careful not to over boost it. I'll press J to turn my clipping off, looking pretty solid. And I'm sure you're gonna talk about this tool, but I love HSL. I love the fact that I could just say luminance and grab the on image tool and click on the area that I wanna massage, bringing down the darkness of the sky, going after the clouds there and targeting them. Taking a look here at the rocks. It's just really nice to just target your zones and let Lightroom do its trick. Now we'll talk about other techniques, but we might as well remove the big distracting object while we're at it. Normally I'd go to light uh, over to Photoshop for this. I think it's a little bit better, but we could do a basic here and take out our distraction. And what Lightroom will try to do is do the basic clone within. I'm a bigger fan of Photoshop here, but we'll let it do its thing and let it try to take that out. It auto guesses on the point. And if I was in a hurry, that's not bad. We can though move that around to other areas and let it analyze if we think there's a better zone and it will try to calculate. I think taking from the field here worked a little bit better. So as you see there, sometimes more pictures tends to be better. And uh, one of the things that always I find interesting is that people forget that you don't just have to use panoramas to go wide. Sometimes I find myself shooting in a really small space and sure, I can go ahead and shoot it like this and try to go wide, but that's as wide as I was able to get. But by stacking and doing a vertical panorama, I was able to stitch that together. And normally this is not a very ideal situation. It's super cramped. I was climbing down into this little hole area here, but when we merge this, it's become incredibly forgiving. And so when you do something like this, you could say, oh, cylindrical. Cylindrical because we're going up the curve of the wall, shooting kind of like a almost a 180 degree arc. And then thanks to that boundary warp, it'll start to fill in those edges and you've got a pretty usable image. And so once you click merge, you're ready to go. So I'm gonna pass back to you, Tim, but I, there were some great questions in there. Are you ready to tackle a few of those? I just wanted to Absolutely. show people a little bit more on the histogram and a little bit more on those camera profiles, but I'll stop sharing and pass back to you. Sounds good, yeah, thank you. And uh, good tips there also. Also a fan of panoramic photography. I don't do it nearly as often as I should. It's one of those that seems to kind of slip out of my mind and I don't focus on as much as uh, I might like to otherwise, but you can get some really great effects, especially I think photographers have a tendency to forget about those vertical panoramas. And in some cases they can really be uh, incredible, both in terms of providing that same wide field of view in a sense, but also being a little more unique because we've all seen many horizontal panoramas. The, the verticals have a tendency, I think, to stand out a little bit more. Uh, so I see Connie had asked a question, want to see large scale thumbnails to preview photos, what would you recommend? So in the context of Lightroom Classic, there's a couple of different things. So if we're in the library module, we can switch to the grid view display. So I can press the letter G on the keyboard to switch to the grid view display. And then on the toolbar down below the grid view or the loop view for that matter, we can hide or reveal. So if you don't see your toolbar, just press the letter T on the keyboard. And then with the grid view display, we have a thumbnail slider over on the right-hand side. And so I can increase or decrease the size of those thumbnails, which depending on your resolution and your personal preference, whether you work in grid versus loop, loop view, for example, that can be a big help. And then also within the develop module, well, within any of the modules, because remember, we always have the film strip down at the bottom of our screen on the bottom panel in Lightroom Classic. And that's just a perpetual view of whatever images are currently available in the current folder, or collection, et cetera, based on filters we've applied and what have you. But we have on that film strip, it, it's not readily apparent that we can adjust the size of the thumbnails, but actually if we get our mouse right on the edge of that bottom panel, I can click and drag that panel upward or downward within reason. I can't get huge thumbnails down there, but I can get a larger panel so that I have larger thumbnails if you prefer. And I saw, let's see here, we had another question scrolling here. Maybe that got addressed. Uh, nope, look, maybe somebody else answered that. I was question. asking about if you use the histogram as your Oh, editing. yes, which Rich answered. And you know, so for me personally, I don't, I don't tend to reference the histogram because I use that clipping preview within the image itself to get a sense of whether or not I'm clipping in highlights or shadows. 
and I don't tend to adjust on the histogram, not for any good reason, just out of habit, but Rich makes a great point that you can hover over that histogram to see what that range is in a general sense that you'll be adjusting for the exposure versus highlights or shadows, for example. And so you know, it's one of those little tricks I find a lot of photographers aren't aware of the fact that you can literally use the histogram as though it were a set of sliders matching whites, blacks, highlights, shadows, and exposure, for example, but a handy little tip there. Uh, so I do want to turn my attention. We talked about detail in the context of highlights versus shadows. There's also enhancement for detail or texture in photos. And I think of this sort of like a variation on sharpening. It's just sharpening that's happening at different scales. So I'm going to start off talking about texture and clarity. Clarity has been around for a while. Texture is a little bit newer. But in our basic section on the right panel within the develop module, we have texture, clarity, and dehaze. And the difference here, they all enhance detail or enhance contrast or edge contrast, you might say. They're just operating at different scales or different sizes. My favorite among these three, generally speaking, is clarity, because I mentioned I like a little bit of contrast, a little bit of oomph to my photos, and so very often, so I'll increase clarity here, starting off with the clarity slider, increase that value, and you'll start to see that our mid-tone contrast is getting enhanced. It almost has the appearance of the photo getting in a little bit sharper focus. It's not literally the exact same thing as sharpening, but it's close, just happening at a larger scale, giving us more mid-tone contrast. And this really can enhance the perceived detail, the perceived sharpness, the general contrast of the photo. I love clarity. And so I'll apply very typically anywhere, you know, low end typically is kind of around 20, maybe up to around 50 before I start getting nervous that maybe I'm overdoing it just a little bit and I need to check my work. But that's one that can be very, very helpful in terms of just overall mid-tone contrast. And then we have texture, which is in many respects the same concept. It's closer to sharpening than clarity is. It's enhancing finer details. And so, you know, I always think of like wood texture, you know, that sort of thing. So that we've got the very fine detail that we really want to enhance. But even with a photo like this, with some of the finer details in the wheat in the foreground or the tree in the background, as I increase the value for the texture slider, I start to enhance those finer textures, the, the more subtle, the smaller areas of texture within the photo, smaller areas of contrast. And Tim, As I think that, that points nicely to Bonnie's question. I think there's sure. the two parts. She was saying, well, how did you get that great focus with the tree and the wheat? I'd like to point out, first off, you're at F22. So right. clearly <laughs> you're probably helps. tripod shooting here or very, yes. very stable. Yep. Uh, so that's giving you that great depth of field. But you're also doing some selective sharpening there with the texture slider and everything else. And so it's just bringing out that edge detail. And so it's a combination of shooting technique and processing technique, right? Yes, absolutely. And I'll add to your point about the shooting technique is also considering hyperfocal distance, which for landscape photographers is a concept that can be very helpful. In a nutshell, hyperfocal distance relates to the distance at which you can focus and still have infinity in focus, which means how far do I need to be essentially when I'm focusing to ensure that I have everything from the foreground all the way to infinity in sharp focus. And in this particular case, as it happens, I was right on the edge of that limit. So I'd used a calculator. I used the PhotoPills app for a variety of these different calculations. But for hyperfocal distance, calculating, all right, if I focus at five feet away, is that going to work? Because this wheat in the foreground was right about five feet from my camera. And sure enough, the hyperfocal distance, if I remember correctly enough, was something in the four foot range. And so as long as I'm focusing beyond that, then I will have everything in the frame in focus. And that obviously helps as well. So a lot of depth of field, but specifically one of the challenges in landscape photography is making sure that if you've got something in the foreground that's relatively close, that you're actually able to get that in focus as well as everything off in the middle ground and the distance. And then once you've got it all in focus, then you might want to enhance those details just a little bit. I suppose I should hasten to add that for these various sliders, we can also use a negative value if we want to reduce that texture effect, essentially. So in this case, clarity or texture, this can give us a more sort of ethereal dreamlike kind of a view, which certainly can work for many landscapes. I have a tendency though, to go in the positive direction for those adjustments. And so that's clarity and texture, essentially enhancing detail, mid-tone contrast at a fairly small scale within the photo. So then turning our attention to you know, the bane, one of the banes of any landscape photographer's existence, and that's haze. We're out there and outdoors. Just one second before you go deeper yeah, on this, the, the app that Tim mentioned was PhotoPills. 
And uh, we'll actually have the creator of PhotoPills speaking at the Visual Storytelling Conference later this week. We'll put the link in the chat, but that's a free four-day event that you guys could sign up for. And uh, PhotoPills, the actual founder, is going to be showing and explaining how to use that app. Tim, I'm so glad that uh, you, you aren't afraid to admit that using an app helps. You know, we, we can't keep all those math numbers in our head. There's no problem with cheating because you're just using the right tool for the job. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, calculating equivalent exposures, the depth of field, hyperfocal distance, taking that into account, as well as planning, you know, I use the PhotoPills app for photos that include the sun or the moon, where I can plan exactly where the sun or the moon, a full moon rising over the heart of Rome in Italy a number of years ago. And I knew exactly which direction the moon was going to be positioned in when it came up over the horizon, thanks to PhotoPills. So a tremendous tool for planning various aspects of your photography, including, you know, as I mentioned, calculating hyperfocal distance and depth of field, but also in terms of planning for the sun and the moon and the Milky Way and meteor showers and all sorts of fun stuff. So I'll, I will have to tune in. That'll be a great presentation, I'm sure. All right, so then getting to that third presence slider in the context of detail or texture. So we've got texture clarity and dehaze. This obviously a little bit of a hazy photo, hazy day. Not much we can do with that. You know, you might be able to use a filter to help cut back on that haze a little bit, but the dehaze slider in Lightroom Classic is just absolute magic. And so I can increase that value and the haze just melts away. It boggles my mind every time I increase the value for this slider. We can again use a negative value if you're looking for that, you know, San Francisco foggy day kind of a look. But for me, you know, if you want to cut back on that haze, if you're getting frustrated with haze, don't worry, we've got a fix for you. And that dehaze works pretty well. A couple of a little side notes there, you might be able to tell on the screen here that as I increase the value for dehaze, my shadows start to darken up, I would say a little bit too much. And also there's a tendency because we're talking about some shadow areas in this case, there's a tendency for more blue to come out than you might like for the image. Simple quick fixes, of course, for both of those. So I can go to the shadow sliders we saw earlier and just increase that value as I'd like in order to open up those shadows a little bit. I still want contrast, but I don't want you know deep, dark contrast in this case. And then for that color, just a simple shift of the temperature, the temp slider, just take that toward a little bit of a more golden look rather than the blue will help to compensate. In this case, it was really truly obviously golden hour. So maybe bringing that color back to a little bit more realistic look as well. Now, of course, we're not always trying to get rid of haze. In fact, sometimes we're embracing haze. In fact, on a day like this, this is from the top of Steptoe Butte out in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington state, for those of you that are familiar. The haze for this type of a photo can be a little bit frustrating, but then you can always make lemonade out of lemons, right? And you, you get that hazy day and we can come away with a shot like this, in which case dehaze, I, I wouldn't even tempt myself. I, why, why would I want to get rid of that haze that's causing such a beautiful color, really nice effect in the image is kind of the, the layers that just fade off into infinity. But you might want to actually use clarity. So remember, these are all very similar adjustments, just operating at a little bit of a different scale. Clarity can give us just a little bit more contrast, which you don't necessarily always want. My feeling is you should understand what the various adjustments in Lightroom Classic do so that you know which tool to go to for a particular effect. But more importantly, I think, is that you understand how it's working to some extent so that you know what you really want. Do you want, in this case, for example, to enhance that sort of hazy appearance, maybe with a negative value for clarity, or do I want to maintain the hazy appearance? I don't want to dehaze, but I'd like a little bit more contrast within those layers Then I might use a positive value for that clarity adjustment. Even when I'm not exactly trying to get rid of the haze, I'm not exactly trying to get a, a real contrasty photo. I'm just trying to tease out just a little bit more contrast to help some of those details stand out just a little bit better. All right, so to, Rich, do we have any other questions I should address? Have you been taking a look at those in the background there? There are a lot. I'm actually queuing up uh, an example okay. of Lightroom Mobile to show next Perfect. here. There's a Perfect. question about Lightroom Mobile. And we wanted a, a more in-depth explanation of sort of texture versus clarity uh, to explain why you might use one over the other. Yeah, so let's start with that. So texture and clarity, I would say in many respects, they're very, very similar adjustments. Think of them as sharpening 
as contrast enhancement, just happening at a different scale. And so if we come back to our clarity adjustment, especially take that to a very high level versus a more moderate level, you'll notice that we almost start to see these sort of contrast clouds, if you will. If you kind of focus on some of the areas of the tree here, for example, as I increase and decrease, you'll notice that we're getting this enhancement, the sky's getting darker in certain areas, the tree's lightening in some areas and darkening in other areas. And so that's happening at a fairly large area. So think of it as I'm you know, brightening up this overall cluster of leaves at the end of the branch. I'm not enhancing each individual leaf in a manner of speaking. Whereas texture is the opposite. It's the very, very fine details in a photo. And so if we take a look at the texture slider, we're working at a very fine scale akin to sharpening the image. Whereas with clarity, notice that now we're working among the clusters of leaves, you might say, as opposed to the individual leaves. So again, just the size of the areas of the image that are being affected. And so, you know, looking right. at the close in areas here, same sort of concept, you know, the very fine details versus the general contrast in those areas. And I would say that clarity is going to be more of a contrast adjustment whereas texture is going to feel a little bit more like a sharpening adjustment, if that helps. I'm going to try, Tim, really quick to share an example from Lightroom Mobile while sure. you take a look over at the couple of questions, folks. And these Absolutely. are great questions, guys. We really uh, appreciate you guys sending these in. We're trying really hard to uh, show you some of these different options here. So uh, I'm sharing Lightroom Mobile here from my iPad. Can you guys all see that correctly? I'm glad to see it worked. <laughs> I plugged it in with a lightning cable and it, or not a lightning cable, the, uh, the uh, USB-C cable and actually shows up. So I'm happy with that. So you could see that we have really a lot of the same controls. So in this case, I can browse and invoke a profile and I can go under the camera matching there and take a camera profile such as landscape or neutral if I don't want quite as vivid colors. You could see that these are simulating what the camera manufacturer recommends. Plus Adobe also has its own set of profiles. So those same powerful tools are definitely in there. You just need to access them. So for those of you wondering, I'm just editing on an iPad Pro, but you have the same controls on a phone, just not quite as much screen real estate. So that's why I'm, I'm doing it here. So you'll notice there that, you know, we can still do most of the same things. I can't do my favorite, grab the histogram and massage it. But if we do take a look here, we can see the same general controls allowing us. And that shortcut as we're taking a look and working through our images, really allows us to pull things into the right neighborhood to make sure, you know, so if I click, it's gonna go full screen, I could click back. There is no harm in trying the word auto, uh, but you are gonna find that it tends to really boost those colors. So I'm gonna take that back to the neutral state here so it's not quite so intense. And then looking at things, it's just a matter of the massage. Now, I like the fact that I could really pinch to zoom in so that I could pay close attention to what's happening as we are massaging things. And notice there, we can start to drag. And so when you are zoomed in like this, it's actually gonna hide it to give you more real estate, which is kind of nice. Looking at some of those details that we were talking about, this is giving us that control as we work so we can adjust things such as sharpening as we could take a look there at some of those effects, bringing out the texture. And what I always like to do as I, take a look at that is make sure that I'm not harming the image. So if you go too far, especially when you're zoomed in, you can see that you're adding an excess detail and noise. So I like to balance that out with just a little of each and make sure that it's holding up nicely. As you start to look at your edges there too, pay attention and make sure that you're not adding excessive amounts of texture or noise. So here we're getting a little bit aggressive and taking a look under the details section what I'm gonna do is back off the sharpening so it's not so intense, that's helping quite a bit, and just put a little bit of noise reduction in. But again, by being zoomed in, you can see what's happening there on your mobile device. And I hope as you see, there's really quite a bit that you can do right on the iPad phone or Android device. So, you know, there was a great question, you know, am I missing out by working on the mobile edition? No, I think you're gaining because I could pop a memory card reader into this or use the wireless transfer features on my phone and, and bring an image to life right away. 
So I don't have to wait until I get home to edit. I can edit in the field or at a coffee shop and, you know, you just got great battery life. So, you know, Kerman, don't feel bad about using your tablet, use whatever tool you have and just take the time to learn how to use the different settings. So I hope that that gives you confidence that there's a lot you could do there. Tim, I imagine you use Lightroom on your mobile devices from time to time as well. Absolutely. And especially in terms of sharing photos, it's a great way to get photos from Lightroom Classic via synchronized collection to the cloud, Adobe's Creative Cloud. And then they automatically sync to Lightroom Mobile or Lightroom in a web browser, by the way, at lightroom.adobe.com, yeah. signing in with your Adobe Creative Cloud account. And so for sharing, I find it great. Also for just reviewing images, you know, if I know I'm going to have a long flight, then I might synchronize a batch of photos from a trip. And then I can assign star ratings, for example, on the return flight, at least apply some basic adjustments, maybe to kind of see which direction I might want to take a photo, because all of that's going to synchronize then to my catalog in Lightroom Classic so that I can carry on or fine tune those adjustments as needed. Cool. Well, Tim, why don't you show a couple more image examples and then I'll give a quick demo of Aftershoot that we mentioned at the start and then we'll, we'll wrap it up with some extra demos from you and I'll do a little bit more. And this is great. I, people are loving what you're showing. So keep up the great stuff. Excellent. Thank you for that, everybody. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here again. And I see there was a couple questions that I was taking a look at and so first off, well, actually one near and dear to my own heart, uh, James Lamb asked about, do you carry, do you ever carry a camera as opposed to a smartphone on your bike rides? Uh, I'm, if that was directed at me, I guess he knows that I'm a cyclist. Uh, and the answer is uh, pretty much no, because I'm pretty serious about cycling. And so I don't want to put a, a real camera at risk, which might sound silly because I'm putting my smartphone at risk, but that's in my Jersey pocket and I keep it safe. I, hopefully I'm keeping it safe so far, knock on wood, not any real problems with smartphones in the back pocket. And then there was also a question about, well, uh, two of them here, now opinion of lens flare, uh, art or artifact, great way of putting that question. And I would say it depends. Sometimes lens flare can look really nice. It can add an interesting element to a photo. Other times, not so much. Part of that depends on the lens. The number of lens elements is gonna contribute to how many little you know, circles of lens flare you have in there, for example. And you know, the lens aperture determines the shape of that lens flare. So sometimes it looks really nice, other times not so much. So it's sort of, I think of that many of these considerations is does it look like it was intentional? Does it look like you wanted to have that lens flare? Or does it look like it was an accident? And if it was an accident, was it a happy accident? But in any event, I think that uh, it's worth you know keeping in mind that that's something that any photographer is going to have a different opinion on, and it depends on the particular image and circumstances. And then there had been a question about shooting. Uh, let's see, sometimes you have no choice but to shoot in midday or nearly midday sun. How do you minimize that effect in post? Well, as it happens, this photo was captured under the uh, uh, midday conditions, right around the middle, right around lunchtime, as it happens. I think it was right before lunch. So I was probably hungry, starting to get cranky and wanted to just get my photos <laughs> and get moving. And so I'll talk about a couple of those adjustments there. Mostly comes down to contrast. But here I want to first talk about profile-based lens correction. So with landscape photography, very often, pretty common, I would say for many photographers, we're shooting with a little bit of a wider field of view. We want to show more of the landscape as opposed to isolating our view on just a small segment of the landscape before us. And so especially with wide angle lenses, we have a tendency to get a fair amount of distortion, sometimes vignetting. And Lightroom Classic supports a pretty good number of lenses in terms of profiles that essentially describe the natural behavior, if you will, of the lens itself. And so I actually apply with the profile-based lens corrections as a preset while importing my photos. When I import my photos into Lightroom Classic, they all get a basic preset from the develop module that includes, among other things, the profile-based lens correction. So if we go down on the right panel in the develop module to lens corrections, we have a couple of checkboxes here. There's remove chromatic aberration, which as a very general rule, I'd say you can leave turned on. If you've got chromatic aberrations, it does a pretty good job of toning them down, if not eliminating them. If there are no chromatic aberrations, which are just color fringing in high contrast areas, especially backlit scenes, depending on the lens, then it's usually not gonna do any harm either. So I usually leave that turned on, but more to the point here, enable profile corrections. So if I turn on that checkbox, then hopefully Lightroom Classic will look at metadata, see which lens was used, 
and select a profile for me automatically. Usually if we have setup set to auto, that'll work just fine. If for any reason that doesn't work and I've seen this not work properly on more than a few occasions, almost without exception, if we then just choose the manufacturer of the lens, not the camera, but the lens from the make pop-up that will usually cause Lightroom to catch up with itself essentially and select the correct model and profile. But when in doubt, you can also choose the specific model lens and the particular profile, which in most cases is just going to be the Adobe profiles, although other photographers, et cetera, could certainly build their own profiles. But the key is to have, if it's supported, not every lens is supported, not every lens manufacturer is supported, but for those that are, if we choose the right lens, we're compensating for distortion. So think barrel versus pin cushion distortion, as well as vignetting. And so now if I just toggle the checkbox for enable profile corrections, Here's the before. You can see a fair amount of vignetting around the corners. And especially as I toggle back and forth, notice the outer edges sort of, you know, warping or bending inward and outward. So that lens distortion that we're getting with that wide angle lens. So especially for wide angle lenses, but really for any supported lens, this is usually going to give you, I think, a better starting point in terms of distortion as well as vignetting. And if, you know, in this case, I was fortunate that those clouds are helping to block that midday sun a little bit. But if you've got a photo that is exhibiting a little bit too much of the contrast that we get at the midday, uh, as well as you know, maybe a lack of saturation, because we had to stop down, or we had to adjust our exposure downward. And so we're just and we've got a bad lighting angle, for example, we're not getting a, a proper reflection for all that color in terms of the light, then first and foremost, obviously setting the whites and blacks, as I looked at earlier, midday type of scenario, that's where I'm even more inclined to reduce the value for highlights and then to increase the value for shadows so that we're cutting back on some of the problematic contrast in the scene. And then also boosting that vibrance can be tremendously helpful. In some cases, you know, glare and reflection, haze, you're just gonna have more problems with the overall lighting conditions midday. But with a variety of the various adjustments we've already talked about, you can obviously sort of compensate for some of those. And then I also saw a question about the white balance adjustment. Uh, white balance adjustments been changed recently. Using the eyedropper no longer seems to work well. Not to my knowledge, but part of the reason that I wouldn't know is that I don't tend to use the eyedropper. And there's a good reason for that. Well, at least I think it's a good reason. In fact, let's go to an image where it's we don't have as much yellow, so it's not going to be as difficult to see the difference. So we have essentially three ways to adjust the overall balance of colors in the context of temperature and tint in the, the context of a white balance adjustment. We can choose a preset. The default would be just as shot. We can let Lightroom try to figure it out for us, or we can use the presets just like what we have in the camera that I'm sure you're all familiar with, daylight versus cloudy, for example. So I could choose a particular option. Cloudy will warm up the photo a little bit. Daylight will cool it down a little bit. And then we can also use the eyedropper. And the idea there is that we use the eyedropper tool, the color sampler, to choose something that should be neutral. Well, especially in landscape photography, I would say there's not much that should be neutral more often than not, or at least we don't know what should be neutral. You would assume the clouds, for example, but if we make the clouds neutral, then we're neutralizing a lot of the color. If we had a golden hour photo, for example, we're gonna start to strip out a lot of those golden tones, the yellows in the image. And so, you know, if I go to a blue area, then I'm going to get an image that's too yellow. If I go to a green area, I'm going to get an image that's looking a little bit too magenta or blue, depending on how close to yellow versus green that color was. And so my view is that I'm always going to end up fine tuning with temperature and tint. And so I don't use the eyedropper to sample. Obviously, if I was doing product photography, then I might need a perfectly neutral value with a gray card in the frame that I'm clicking on with the eyedropper. But for landscape photos, there's a little bit of artistic license that we might exercise. And so more often than not, I'm just starting off with the as shot setting and going directly. I, I will ignore the pop-up. I will ignore the eyedropper and just go directly to the temp and tint sliders. Temp, of course, between blue and yellow. And for those of you who feel that you don't have a good eye for color, just swing through the extremes. We all would agree, I think, that this is a little bit too, well, a lot bit too blue, and this is too yellow. So we can kind of go through those extremes and gradually settle down as we find a range that seems to be working nicely for that particular image. And then with tint, we don't need to swing quite as far because we don't really need, a, in most cases, a green versus a magenta image. 
but trying to find the right balance that'll give us just the right color values within the photo can be certainly tremendously helpful. All right, I did mention I'm a control freak. And so I do like to exercise great control and Richard tipped a little bit on this earlier about HSL being great for adjusting individual colors and especially working directly on the image. And so scrolling down just a little bit here, we've got the HSL slider. So if I switch to HSL, that stands for, of course, easy to figure out here, hue, saturation, and luminance or luminosity or brightness. And so we can adjust these color attributes, hue, saturation, and luminance for the individual color ranges within a photo. And so you might have a situation here, you know, the greens need a little bit of work or the yellows are looking a little too orange or whatever the case might be. We can focus our adjustments very easily on individual ranges of colors. So Rich already mentioned the on image adjustment, the little kind of target there where I can click to activate that and then go click and drag within the image to lighten or darken based on color or increase or decrease saturation, for example. We can also just work directly on the color sliders. So Hue, you can kind of think of as color balance, essentially. It's shifting the basic color value for an image. Saturation, we already talked about a little bit, the intensity or purity of those colors. And then luminance, of course, is the, the relative brightness of an individual color range. And so I could take, let's say the yellows here, I need to get them looking a little bit sharper. Well, not literally sharper, but just better. I can take the yellow hue, which again is sort of like a color balance for just the yellows in this case, take those yellows toward more of an orange appearance or toward more of a green appearance. Obviously going to the extremes is not gonna work out all that well, but we can find just the right little adjustment for those colors to get them looking better. You know, the greens to look a little more true green versus maybe too yellow versus too cyan, for example, and then adjusting the saturation levels for each of those. So I can go through and let's go to those oranges, maybe get them a little more red look and see those orange trees in there. Uh, I'll shift those, I'll exaggerate that shift toward more of a pure kind of reddish look there by taking the orange a little too far over to the left. But then not only are we able to shift the actual colors, we can adjust the saturation. So maybe now I feel that the oranges or the reds are looking a little bit too hot. So I can reduce the saturation for the oranges and the reds as needed within the image to make them look slightly more realistic. <laughs> We've already pushed the limits here a little bit maybe. I could boost the saturation for the yellows and or the greens, for example, as I feel appropriate. And so that can be really, really helpful for targeting adjustments, for fine tuning individual ranges of colors within the photo. There's also, by the way, color grading, which enables you to have a similar sort of control, but instead of adjusting on a per color basis, you're adjusting based on luminance value. So I'm adjusting the dark areas, the shadow areas versus the midtones versus the highlights, for example. And in addition to just- There was a, yeah, go ahead. a question from Therese that I wanted to address. And she said, how do you white balance if you have color blindness Therese, there's a lot of things you can do. For example, uh, I often will use a color checker from x right and people think of that a lot of times for portrait and other types of photography, but you can absolutely use it in landscape photography and shoot a yeah. reference chart early on or manually white balance your camera in the field by using either a sheet of white paper or an actual white balance target. Yeah. But you can calibrate your camera either during shooting or after shooting by using one of those targets. And that makes it really easy to get accurate color, even if you don't feel confident or you have a harder time seeing it. Excellent. Yeah, the good point. And it's something I'm not personally familiar with in terms of my experience, but something I know can be a challenge based on the, the photographers that I've worked with who do experience color blindness. Uh, which, you know, this next tip is equally, you know, going to be a little bit of a challenge in that respect. But in addition to just applying or exerting control over individual color ranges in a photo, sometimes you just have colors that are problematic. And so for landscape photography, a very common issue is magenta off in the distance. The atmospheric haze causes a scattering of light, which can lead to more of a magenta color off in the distance. And even if you're not colorblind, magenta can actually be a real tricky color to catch in your images because it's very close to the end of the visible spectrum for human vision. And so even if you've got perfectly normal vision, you're gonna have a little bit of a harder time picking out the magenta in an image. And so it's one of the scenarios where if I'm suspicious, so with the landscape photo where we've got a little bit of haze in the distance, I'm gonna be concerned about magenta. And so one of the tricks I'll use going back into the basic section on the right panel here is just take that saturation up to an extreme. 
And so here, all of the colors obviously look a little bit over-processed. I'm not looking for, are they over-processed or not? Because they obviously are. I'm looking for, are the colors the right colors? And so we see, of course, in the red rock here, we've got the yellows and the oranges, a little bit of red. And in the river, we've got a little bit of the, the greens and whatnot. The sky's looking nice and neutral, a little bit of blue in there, but that's not really a problem. But what catches my eye personally as a little bit of a problem is that magenta off in the distance. And so using that saturation boost as a way of sort of revealing the colors that might otherwise be hidden, I'll go ahead and double click on the slider handle for saturation to reset that. And so even without the colors being exaggerated, I would say that those magentas off in the distance are still a little bit problematic. Let me get this back to 100% preview size, zoom setting. So you can see that we've got, uh, it's not as obvious as we had earlier. If I boost that saturation, we'll see though the, the magentas out there could be potentially problematic, not something that is gonna look all that good in a large print of this image, for example. And so going back to HSL, pretty straightforward. I would focus my attention on probably purple and magenta. Just a reminder of the tip that Rich shared earlier, the on image adjustment. So I can click on that target, in this case, to the left of saturation, move my mouse out over the image. And as I move my mouse around, if you pay attention to the sliders for purple and magenta, you'll notice that depending on where I position my mouse, I can get the purple versus somewhere in here, I'll find there it was magenta right there. The magenta gets highlighted, both the word magenta and the box associated with the numeric value. And I'll move around a little here and get to purple and you see purple is highlighted. And that tells me which color I'm currently sort of focused on. And so now if I click on the image, I can drag downward, in this case to desaturate or upward to increase saturation. So if you're not totally sure what color it is, you can just use that on image adjustment feature, obviously, and then click. And what I love there, again. Tim, before you close it, is yeah. that it actually moved a little bit of the blue too. So while it was mostly purple, the exactly. blues affected it slightly. And that's one of the best things about that on image tool is it'll exponentially move the other sliders the right amount if it's not pure purple. Like in this case, it was purple with a hint of blue. Exactly. Or it could have been a little magenta in this case, obviously, based on what we saw earlier. But yes, it's going to take, you know, what is the overall balance of colors in this area? And here, for example, as you point out, you know, lots of purple, a little bit of blue could have been lots of purple and a little bit of magenta, depending on which area specifically I was pointing at at the time that I clicked and dragged. But that gives us great control and a little bit simpler, more fluid approach. You can always though, if I click right back on that on image adjustment tool, I can always go back and fine tune. Now in this case, obviously I don't want gray cliffs way off in the distance. So I bring that purple up just a little bit, maybe take the blues, maybe even the magentas down a little bit more, find the right balance that I think is gonna work well within the image. And then of course, zoom out, kind of a, a sanity check, if you will, making sure that I'm not causing other problems in the image. Uh, okay, it makes no sense, but let's say that I had a bouquet of red roses in the foreground of this image that have kind of a magenta look to them. I would have turned them into potentially kind of grayish roses. So you wanna make sure you're not causing other problems in the image. If there were other areas that we wanna preserve, then we might need to go to a targeted adjustment. But of course, in this case, I've got a situation where that magenta and purple sort of tone was limited to a range where essentially all of it was problematic. So I'm happy to tone down all of it effectively. So Tim, before you go to your last image there, yeah. I want to take just a moment to show a little bit of after shoot, and then I'm going to do one more image on mobile. And then I will pass back to you. You've got a beauty there in number 10. I'm looking forward to seeing that adjustment. So let me just uh, walk through a couple quick things. And thank you guys for coming out today. Uh, today's event is sponsored by Aftershoot. This is a cool product that uses AI to help identify the best shots. And uh, what it focuses on is really identifying the best of each image. So uh, to one of the questions that you would ask actually, Tim, like what happens if each shot is perfect? Uh, what it does is it picks the best of each type of shot. So you have the ability in Aftershoot to say, okay, look within a certain time period, and then it will identify the one that's sharpest, best composition, best color. And uh, so even sometimes if you bracket, you know, that can help with safety. And so it's designed to really speed things up. And uh, it doesn't reject any images, rather it picks the best of each set. 
So it's designed to pick at least one image out of every similar one. And depending on your style of shooting, more for nature shooting than say uh, traditional landscape where you're set up, you're going to find that like when shooting things like flowers that blow in the wind or shooting uh, nature shots where the birds move around, it can be a little tricky. And so this is going to make it easy to get that. Aftershoot has a free version that you guys can absolutely try out. And what it does is it can detect blurred photos automatically, as well as closed eyes for portrait. And then the uh, version that costs $10 a month, uh, which we put a code in also for photo focus, can also do things like identify which images are going to do best on social media. They actually have an algorithm where they took a half a million photos from Instagram and analyzed which ones scored the highest. And so they'll go through your photo shoot and flag the ones that they think will do best on social media. And they also can identify best poses and other things. So I'll show you really quickly how this works. When you launch after shoot, you just make an album. And after shoot is designed to be used before you go into Lightroom, but you can absolutely use it at any point in time. And all you have to do is grab a series of images that you want to process. So I'll just go in here and I'm going to grab this uh, shoot from the Eagles. And so I'll just import it. And what it begins to do is it loads those photos in and you can immediately start manually culling if you want. But what happens is, is you give it some basic criteria. So you look it over and you say, okay, I want to start culling. And what it's going to do is you set the criteria hey, how much are you willing to accept things being in focus or not in focus? Well, I was shooting fast moving eagles, but I wanna keep things relatively in focus. So I don't mind a little bit of a blurry background, but I want the subject to be sharp. You can also decide how many sets it makes. And if you're shooting landscapes, the benefit with extreme is it doesn't do any time constraints. It just looks for visually similar images. But if you're shooting things in burst, like shooting, uh, say, flowers, then you can go with time-based where it'll look at the best 60 seconds. And then you decide how many shots it picks per set and the percentage that it's going to adjust for social media. That's the sneak previews. You could then also look for closed eyes, blur detection, and duplicates. I'm going to get rid of closed eyes because I was shooting eagles. I don't need that. But I do care about the blurs. And then you totally get to assign what it does. It can actually add a keyword for things like blurred. It can add the selected. You assign the star ratings that you want. And when you're all set, you just click next. If you've already put the images into Lightroom, well, in Lightroom, you could tell Lightroom to write sidecar files by writing separate XMP files. And Aftershoot can actually update those without overwriting things. So you can, only, you can actually cull existing photos and have it just update. So now what it's gonna do is it's gonna analyze through that and start to process. Now, processing about 400 pictures, it's gonna take it about two, three minutes. So while that finishes, let me show you something over in Lightroom really quick, and then we'll come back. So I was playing in Lightroom here, and I just wanted to show you another instance of panorama. Sometimes people say, I don't shoot panorama because I don't bring my tripod out or I don't know how to shoot panorama. Well, you could be kind of crazy with it. Here, I just did handheld and I was shooting on an Olympus camera and there was this crazy tree all over the place. And so what I was able to do was just sort of capture this giant area. And so let me select that range and I'm gonna merge those together. So I'll just do a photo merge to panorama. And in this case, because I was handheld, you could see what spherical did, not great. I could look at cylindrical, which is more for a curved image up and down. And that's putting a good coverage there or perspective where you kind of build it off of the center. Well, here there was no clear center point. So looking at cylindrical, I'm gonna take the boundary warp out and let it start to fill those edges in. And that's looking pretty good. But here's another little box that people missed. You could either auto crop or let it do content aware fill. And it will actually create new pixels for that fringe. Now, you probably want to crop a little bit at that point, but it's pretty interesting that content aware fill is available right inside of Lightroom. And what it will try to do is make new pixels to fill those edges by analyzing within the image itself. Now, that option takes a bit, especially when you stitch all those together, but that was pretty damn good. 
And so I can click merge now. And I've now got this crazy handheld panorama that lets me really see what's happening. By the way, you can always track the status of those merges up here where it says creating panorama. That lets you know what's happening when you're doing a merge and how it's stitching everything together. So, you know, a big merge like that will take a few seconds, but it's not bad. And so it's really cool to note that you can merge images like that together to get these super big shots that you could then use to tell a compelling story. So I like to point out that panoramas are surprisingly flexible and uh, works pretty well. All right, let me do one more share here and then we'll come back to Aftershoot. And I'm gonna share off of the iPad again, just as an example of working with mobile on the go. And I wanna talk briefly about the ability of using masks, which we've talked about a little bit here. So let's just make sure that it shares. One second, that's the wrong one. Let me try that again. Share, iPad, share. Thinking, <laughs> it's trying, let's see if it makes it. It worked last time. I wanted to show you this whole screen of the iPad. Let's try it one more time. I always love it when things don't work the way they're supposed to. If I have to, I'll share it the other way. But uh, I'm trying to share my screen iPhone via cable. Let's unplug the iPhone itself and see if he takes the AirPad this time. Thinking, took it, perfect. All right, we'll go into Lightroom. And uh, we mentioned the benefit of auto. Never be afraid of the word auto. Auto is just a second chance to get it right quickly. And then, you know, we can look at what's going on here. And I like the ability to use the curve right there on the image. And I could see what's happening with my histogram. And, you know, what I'm paying attention to is sort of the middle there, looking at those clouds. Now, that helps as I'm working the image. And I feel like we're getting in the right ballpark. But I wanted to point out that Adobe offers presets. And instead of just randomly guessing, it actually has an auto analysis and it will look at your image and try to suggest presets now to speed that up. You can also, of course, manually go into the premium ones or you can load up third party ones like you have there. But you know what it did here was it guessed and it looked at my image and made some overall suggestions. And I like where this is getting here into the sky. What I don't like is how the landscape itself is muddy. Well, this is a perfect opportunity for masks. So I'll just click done here to apply that image and go into my masking tool. And when I click plus, there's all sorts of types of masks. So I could just use something as simple as select sky. And this is gonna allow us to basically select the sky area, which is cool. So there, it's gonna do a quick analyze. Now it's just pulling this in here. And what it has to do is it's basically sending it out to the cloud and then sending it back. Okay, so now I'll create that and it creates the sky selection. Not bad, but I don't actually wanna adjust the sky. I wanna adjust everything but the sky. So what's pretty cool is that you have the ability to do things and you know actually do that. So I could say add or subtract or you have the ability to work with these masks. For example, you could duplicate it and then you could actually start to process it. So this gives you the ability to use those masks to make types of selections you want. So it allows you a lot of flexibility as you're working and you can see there how it just affected just the sky. So if I want to, for example, I could darken down the overall sky a little bit to get a better balance between it and the rocks. And now I feel comfortable going into my major area here and just lifting up the overall exposure to balance the scene just a little bit more. So sometimes by subtracting from an area, you could then balance the whole image out a little bit. And those masks are very powerful. On your desktop, what's even better is that those masks can be totally manipulated even further and so you could take a look and actually subtract with a mask or invert a mask, which is pretty cool. So I definitely encourage you to look at some of those there, how you can actually modify these and it lets you be super precise. So let's do another mask here and I'm gonna do a gradient mask. And this time I'm gonna just draw one across the foreground. And so sometimes I like to put something just sort of going from me out to the scene. 
And what's nice about this is now we could just darken the foreground a little bit or fill it in. And it's nice that that just works on that nice little gentle transition there. And notice how simple it is to adjust. Plus, remember, you can subtract or add. So this gives you the ability to modify the mask. So I could say, I wanna subtract from this mask and I'll say, oh, select the sky. And so now that gradient actually combined the two and it was able to subtract the sky from my selection so that it was able to adjust the foreground but not affect the sky area. So these masks are really powerful and it's a lot of fun what you can do. You can see there just how we were able to really bring that image back to life by reaching in with those masks to do just a little bit more. All right, let's finish off after shoot and then we'll take a look at uh, Tim's last image and take any bonus tips. So after shoot was processing through that shoot there. And you can see here that it's almost done. So what it's been able to do is it starts to flag the images that it thinks are good. Now it's not through all 400, but watch already. If I click on blurred, it's able to identify pictures that were blurry. And so in this case, it knows that these shots are not as sharp as they could be. Remember, after shoot just runs in the background. So you can import the entire photo shoot and let it process while you're headed out. The other thing it's gonna to start to do is it's gonna look for the best selects and it will narrow those down, favoring the ones where things are sharp. Now, I'm a novice bird photographer, so my safety method is shoot loose and crop later, uh, which when you're ch chasing you know, eagles flying 35 miles an hour, that's what my suggestion is. But uh, Tim, let's pass this back to you to do a little bit of editing, and then we'll revisit this one last time, and I'll show the final results of the call. All right, sounds good. Thank you very much. In the meantime, a quick little transition here. The couple of questions that I saw pop up here. Uh, one, you would address content aware in the context of that panorama. So there's a follow-up question here. Is that only available as an option in panorama? And essentially, yes. So we don't have content aware in the context of our spot removal tool. So we can't do our normal image cleanup with that technology. Somehow Adobe wants us to continue using Photoshop to get that content aware throughout our workflow. And uh, a brief aside, uh, just to touch base, Rich has been talking about the iPad and you know, by extension, the iPhone. So there's a question here about connecting a memory card to your iPad or your iPhone. And nowadays that's gotten a whole lot easier. Apple used to have a camera connection kit. Now, and especially in the context of the Files app that some of you might be familiar with on iPhone or iPad, you essentially just need an adapter. So the newer iPads, you'll have a, a USB-C connector on iPhone, so lightning connector, and you just need the appropriate adapter to USB, well, or to whatever type of hard drive you're using, and then you can connect yeah. that. So you literally can connect a card reader or a hard drive to an iPad or an iPhone for downloading photos and for sharing photos. It, it really creates a much more streamlined workflow than has been available in the past. And a lot of camera manufacturers have really good mobile apps too, Tim, that I love Likewise. that lets you just wirelessly transfer to your phone and you can exactly. transfer the raw file. Like I saw you were shooting Canon. They make it super easy to just transfer your raw exactly. files correct. Exactly. So a lot of options now, thankfully, that didn't used to be the case. It used to be a little bit of a challenge, but now you can get your raw captures onto your iPhone, iPad, Use that as a storage device while you're traveling, as a download device, and then synchronize them to your computer later, for example. And then I left this image up. There was a, another question here. How, uh, what do you think? How many jurors are capable of detecting the magenta uh, sort of defect that I was talking about, that magenta off in the distance here? Uh, did we share the screen? Let's see. Did, uh, is my screen up? Sure. You share the screen, Tim, if you would. There we go. There we are. Okay. Uh, so again, the, the magenta off in the distance. So the question essentially is if you're in a photo contest, is the juror likely to notice that? It depends on the juror. If it's me, yes, definitely. <laughs> I, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, a double-edged sword, you might say, because I have a hard time just enjoying photos because I'm always looking for the little problems. It was over sharpened. If the color's not right, if it wasn't cropped, you got a little distraction off on the edge. So it, it's going to vary a lot. Each person, each juror who's evaluating images for a photo contest or what have you, camera critique session, et cetera, we've all got our own biases in terms of what we focus on, what matters most to us, what we think is subjective versus more objective. 
And so it varies a lot. I understand it can be frustrating because you never know what you're getting in for with a particular juror evaluating your image. But I would say not a huge percentage of photographers are going to go into that level of, of detail and deduct points. But in any event, I wanted to sort of amplify, build off of Rich was talking about masks and targeted adjustments. So I want to demonstrate that briefly just in the context of Lightroom Classic. So Rich was showing on the iPad essentially the same capabilities. And so I wanted to underscore that in the context of the develop module in Lightroom Classic, for I, most of you, as we saw with the poll earlier, are using Lightroom Classic, but the develop module contains the same adjustments that are found in Adobe Camera Raw, if you're processing your images directly with Photoshop, in Lightroom, the cloud-based version, as well as Lightroom Mobile, which would be both on a mobile device, as in an iPhone, iPad, Android device, or in a web browser via lightroom.adobe.com. It's the same set of adjustments. So I just wanted to show the same concept here in the context of Lightroom Classic, because I know most of you are using that as sort of at least the foundation of your workflow, if not kind of the exclusive domain of your workflow. And so I've been looking at the different sections here on the right panel. We looked in the, the basic section quite a bit, HSL obviously, as well as lens corrections. But up at the top, we've got this toolbar just below the histogram where we'll find some of our tools for otherwise adjusting. So cropping, spot removal, red eye correction, and then our masks. So in earlier versions before Lightroom Classic version 11, we had individual tools, the gradient filter, for example, the radial filter, as well as the adjustment brush. Now those are all sort of coalesced into one masking feature, which actually is a tremendous update to Lightroom Classic and gives us a lot more control, which as you know, I'm a big fan of having that level of control. So I'm gonna choose that masking feature. And because this image does not yet have any masks, instead of seeing my masks, I'm seeing an opportunity to define a mask. And especially for landscape photos, I would say that the select sky feature is just absolutely phenomenal. So Rich already demonstrated that in the context of the iPad. We can have Lightroom automatically detect what it thinks is the key subject in a photo. For a landscape photo, that's probably not gonna work out all that great because we usually don't have a key subject that's standing out. Sort of the foreground is our key subject in a manner of speaking. Select Sky can certainly be tremendously helpful. I'll come to that in just a moment. We can paint an adjustment into specific areas. We can define a linear gradient which Rich demonstrated that concept of an adjustment going from the foreground out toward the middle ground <clears throat> of the image, a radial gradient, same concept, just on an elliptical shape rather than a straight line or linear shape. Color range, you might be familiar with that from Photoshop, we can define a range of colors. So this is like HSL on steroids, essentially, we can define rather precisely a range of colors, the greens and yellows in the foreground here, the foliage, for example, and then apply an adjustment luminance range, which is obviously brightness values. Sometimes that might work for the sky, for example, or the foreground. And then depth range. If you're using an iPhone, for example, with portrait mode, portrait mode captures an image with a depth map, and you can use those photos and use the actual depth map if it's embedded. If I had an iPhone capture here from portrait mode, I would be able to use that depth range feature. You can see it's disabled here because this photo does not have an embedded depth map. But just as a kind of quick introduction to the basic concept and the build on what Rich was showing on the iPad, I'm going to start off with a select sky mask here, and that is AI, artificial intelligence powered, and in this case, it did a pretty good job, I would say, in terms of isolating just the sky within the image. And so if you're familiar with targeted adjustments in Photoshop, in Lightroom Classic, it's much the same thing. There essentially are two main ingredients. There's the mask or the stencil, if you will, the element that defines which area of the image are we adjusting, and then there's the actual adjustment. So I've defined, for example, the sky. What am I going to do to the sky? Maybe I'll darken it up, enhance some contrast, et cetera. And so we have over on the right panel now, since I have a mask active, I'm working now with my targeted adjustments. These are not global adjustments affecting the entire image. They're only affecting the current mask, which in this case happens to be the sky. So maybe, well, for example, I might want to use a bit of clarity. So I'll kind of swing this through the extremes. You can see that I'm getting a clarity enhancement for just the sky. Maybe I'll darken down the sky just a little bit and I could boost the saturation just a little bit. Maybe right about there looks pretty good for the sky in the image. But we have a tremendous amount of flexibility here. We can define multiple masks 
that can have compound structures. So Rich was talking a little bit about subtracting so I can have the sky plus a gradient combining together, for example. So I can add additional masks. I can create a brand new mask. So if I wanted to start over, I could click the plus there and choose to create a mask based on the key subject in the photo that'll be automatically detected based on a gradient, et cetera, whatever the case might be. But I can also duplicate existing masks. So I have my only mask at the moment, mask number one, I can click the ellipsis over on the right hand side and I have options to delete the mask, to delete all of my masks. Right now I wanna duplicate that mask. Why would I wanna do that? Seems a little odd, right? I want another adjustment for the sky. Not really, but it's a good starting point. And so you may have noticed that the sky got a double adjustment because I've literally just duplicated the mask which also duplicates the adjustment. So I'm doubling up on my adjustment, but my intent was not to have yet more adjustments for the sky or a stronger adjustment for the sky, although you certainly could do that if it was warranted, but rather I want to actually adjust the overall appearance of the mask itself, you might. So I'm gonna change my stencil. Now, first off, I wanna point out, we can also rename our masks because mask one and mask two, or in this case, mask one and mask one copy, not necessarily the most helpful names. So especially as I start adding a second or third mask, I do like to rename those masks. So I might call this one uh, landscape, let's say, for example, meaning the foreground of the image. I could go back to my original mask and we'll call that sky, for example, so that I don't have to remember which was which, which was my starting point versus the, you know, the copy that I created based on that. And so for the landscape, I'm still affecting the sky. You can see, by the way, the stencil here, if you're familiar with layer masks in Photoshop, black is not affected or it's blocked and white is where the adjustment is applying or the adjustment is revealed, but we can make changes. So for example, with our sky mask that is part of this landscape structure, I can click on the ellipsis to the right of that sky. So remember I had Lightroom Classic automatically detect the sky and now I can have it do the opposite. Invert that mask. So now I'm applying my adjustments to the foreground. Maybe I don't need that clarity adjustment, but I might want to boost texture a little bit. Probably don't need quite as much saturation there. Perhaps I want to shift the color balance with temp and tint or temperature and tint uh, just a little bit to fine tune, maybe fine tune some of the other adjustments here as well. But the point is just using a very simple example where I can adjust the sky with an automatic selection in this case, invert that, adjust the foreground, and as Rich mentioned, we can then use compound masks. We can take a gradient and use that as the basis of adding to or subtracting from an existing mask. So we can build up some very complicated mask shapes. It can feel a little overwhelming at first, I, I promise you. But keep in mind that when we're applying targeted adjustments with this new update in Lightroom Classic version 11, we're defining a shape, we're defining a stencil essentially that defines a specific area of the image, the sky, the foreground, the left side, the right side in a gradient or an elliptical shape, et cetera, including being able to just paint in specific areas as we see fit. So we're defining that shape, that stencil, and then applying adjustments and we can bounce back and forth between fine tuning the shape of our mask and fine tuning the adjustments. So I can go back, for example, to my sky adjustment and maybe I need to brighten or darken the sky, whatever the case might be, I can switch back and forth between refining my masks and refining my adjustments. It gives us tremendous control, which really ultimately then means all you've got to do is figure out what do you actually want to do with the image, which sometimes is the most challenging aspect of all of this, but figuring out, you know, what are the adjustments I want? What will enhance? What could use a little bit of improvement? And now how do I approach that with Lightroom Classic and targeted adjustments? It can, I, I'm, I have to warn you, I suppose, it can get addictive where you really start to exercise tremendous control over all sorts of different areas of the image, but it is so great to have that control and to have that control right inside of Lightroom Classic without having to, to go off to Photoshop for all these types of adjustments. Excellent, Our, Tim, that's great how's, advice. How's that processing you, you going? you want to share with this image? No, I think we're good. Okay, then let me uh, wrap things up and I'll put up a couple of resources for everyone. So first up, everyone, we're really glad you guys were able to, to join us today. Uh, I promised you I was going to show you quickly the after shoot. Notice what it did is it went through and it found similar photos and it was able to identify amongst this one, you know, which one was the best. This is the one it picked in green. I can quickly go to the next burst 
and it identified, you know, there it found the strike. And if I decide that I want to add another one to that, I can, I could just simply press the A key and it will add it to my combo. But as you see, it's super simple to move between your different selects and it learns from you as you go. So it starts to identify those best shots. The one in green is the one it thinks that you're best and they're continuing to refine their landscape algorithms and everything else. It also has some really cool features here for working that. But what I was able to do was to take that down from 400 to 70 pictures. And I was able to now just with one click, hand this off, you can save the changes and it will update the metadata. So after you save your project, you're able to go ahead and say file, rewrite XMPs, and it will actually update metadata. And if those images were in Lightroom, it would pick that up. It'll also add tags and keywords, which is cool. Or you just click a single button and it's gonna then hand it off to Lightroom or Lightroom Classic and trigger an import allowing you to get a little bit of a less cluttered Lightroom catalog. So instead of putting everything into Lightroom, especially if you're going to Lightroom to the cloud, you can weed things down a little bit. So definitely encourage you to take a look at that. There's some pretty cool things. Uh, to wrap things up for today, and I wanna give you guys a couple of resources. First up, thanks for coming back to our Lightroom Hangout. We're really glad to get things off of the bang. And Tim, you were a great guest. Really appreciate you here. Thank you, you happy to be here. Things. Check out PhotoFocus. We publish articles and resources every single day about photography. So we're glad to uh, have a great team over there sharing information. And uh, thanks to Aftershoot for sponsoring today's event. We really appreciate them helping pick up some of the cost, uh, including being able to pay our guests a little bit for his time and cover the cost of having a Zoom room for you all. So thank you to Aftershoot for that. And uh, Tim, folks can head on over to your website. What's your latest book as well that they should check out? Well, printed book, it's been a long time. So we've, I've been doing some uh, ebooks as well. I've got a couple in progress now, but actually some of the, our audience here may be familiar with my Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, where I publish answers to questions every weekday morning. And it, it never ceases to shock me, but I've been doing that now for 20 years, just over 20 years. And so actually the latest book was a little bit of a memoir, I guess you could say, looking back at some of the more amusing stories and interesting tales from 20 years of publishing the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. And in fact, it's behind the photo and you can actually get it for free if you'd like. So if you head on over to graylearning.com, just remember Tim Gray, Gray has an E there, G-R-E-Y, graylearning.com and track down that behind the photo ebook and just be sure to read the description. There's a coupon code built into that the description there that'll give you the opportunity to have that for free. Awesome. And if, if you want to put a direct link into the chat pod for folks as well, feel free. Thanks guys for coming out for the Lightroom Hangout. And if you've got some time this week and want to keep learning, uh, check out the Visual Storytelling Conference. It's a free event that starts on Thursday. And uh, we've got four days of learning about photography, video, and also social media and business. So some great opportunity. Tim, a big thank you for coming out tonight. You are a great guest. You certainly uh, know your way around Lightroom. And uh, I think people got a lot out of tonight. So if there's anything you. else that you'd like to answer questions, we could tackle a few more. Otherwise, uh, folks, we will be posting the recording of this as well. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a sure. lot of fun. Uh, lots of great comments and questions uh, along the way. There was one question I saw Bob had asked about in, uh, in the image that I was sharing. In fact, uh, you're not sharing the screen now, is that right? Nope, go ahead. We're good to go, excellent. And so he's asking about the halo right along the, the left side of this little uh, mountain peak. How do you get rid of that? Well, th the real answer is to be a, a little bit more selective in terms of how you're applying the adjustment. So in this case, I'm literally using an automatic selection of the sky and then inverting it. And whenever you're inverting this type of a mask, essentially a mask that has been feathered, either because you feathered it, meaning softened the edge of it, or because it was an automatic mask that had that softening built in, there's gonna be this area where the two don't quite overlap very nicely. And so in a situation like this, you're usually gonna get a better result, not by inverting a mask and leaving that as it is, but then adding to or subtracting with the brush. So we can add with the brush and subtract with the brush. So we have the add and subtract options here. And so in this case, let's see if we have, yeah, it looks like it's the, the sky that's a little bit of a problem here. I can add to this mask with the brush. And so I'll just do a real quick effect here and just paint along that edge. 
so that we're modifying the shape of that mass. Just a quick little illustration of the concept there. But we would want to be a little bit more, uh, well, as auto can be perfectly great, but sometimes auto does have its shortcomings. And this would be one where we need to take a little bit more manual control over some of the process, and especially as it relates to the edge. When it comes to masks, they are stencils, essentially. You need to make sure that they're as accurate as possible. They've got nice blending along the edges as appropriate. That can be tricky. Sometimes it'll work out real nicely. The other thing I should hasten to point out is that the stronger the adjustment, the more perfect your mask needs to be. And so if in this case, for example, if we go back to our overall, you know, our exposure adjustment, if I don't darken up the sky as much, or if I don't boost the clarity quite as much, then that halo is going to start to fade away because I don't have this very strong enhancement of one area that's not necessarily blending perfectly into the others. Admittedly, Lightroom Classic doesn't give us as much control over targeted adjustments as we still have in Photoshop, but it's getting very, very close. And I think this concept, once you get used to it, once you get more comfortable with it, makes a lot more sense. I think it's an easier concept to understand than the way it's presented in Lightroom Classic. So definitely worth taking a closer look at. Excellent. Well, Tim, as always, great to see you and uh, the audience yeah. truly appreciated everything. Folks, we will send out to everyone who registered a, a copy. Uh, we'll have a post up uh, in a day or two on Photo Focus, but we'll send you the link to see the replay. And Tim, if you want to share any of those links uh, with the show producer, Hillary, we'll put those in the follow-up email to all the attendees just to drive a few more people over to your site to check out that great ebook. And Tim, Sounds thank great. you again for joining us. It's great to have you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks.